necessary for development and growth in their countries. My name is Susan Siegel, and I will be moderating your session this morning. We have an amazing group of um, experts on the subject, and I'd just like to introduce them um, very, very quickly before I make my opening remarks. Um, to my right, um, sadly, let me just say that Lucy Molinar can't be here with us this morning. Those of you that had an opportunity to see her yesterday realized that, in fact, she doesn't have a voice. So um, we're sorry that she can't join us um, today. So to um, my left is Blas Oliver Lorente. He's the chief executive officer of the Latin American ADECO group from Brazil. Uh, seated across um, from me is Bruno Sanchez Andrade Nunoz. He is the chief scientist from Macbox, Macbox USA, and he's also a young global leader. And it's so exciting to have a young scientist on this panel. Um, seated diagonally across from me, um, we're honored to have uh, La Laurencio Marquez de Albuquerque. Did I say that correctly? Pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> President and General Manager of Latin America of CA, and you live in Brazil and are Brazilian. Yes, I'm a Brazilian, I live in Brazil. And finally, um, on my right, we are really privileged this morning um, to have Pabi Prabhat Hajela? That's good enough. Okay. Um, he's the <laughs> provost from Rensselaer Polytech Institute. Um, and so we have a super uh, panel that will be able to comment on many of the issues uh, that we'll discuss this morning. So what really do we need to think about as we think about this topic? As I travel around Latin America and visit schools and meet people, I think one of the most important things that we need to focus on is engaging students very early in their academic careers. We need to incentivate learning and challenge students from the very beginning. Find ways to encourage students to explore and be innovative in their thinking and like math like science and want to learn English, Spanish, Portuguese, be multilingual because today we live in a global world. Learning needs to be fun and it doesn't just imply memorization, which is how much of learning is still taught in Latin America. To do this, we need to train teachers, giving them the skills to be, to succeed, making them feel proud that they're a teacher. And the challenges that I think this represents are enormous, and it requires new thinking on everybody's part. I think of it as a challenge because we need to create public-private partnerships, but we also need to engage society, NGOs, and parents because one of the challenges many people have talked about in education, not just in Latin America, but in every country, is that education is a long-term proposition. So we need to engage players that go well beyond one or two political terms. And finally, um, we need to think about new models. Carlos Rodriguez Pastor in Peru started something called Innova Schools. Highly rep, 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 you can replicate this um, in many different countries if we chose to. It's a school that's focused on the C's, C minuses, and even D's. He's raising money for scholarships. And what it does is it starts in nursery years teaching children to speak English, but it uses technology to leverage. It uses the Sal Khan Academy 
to actually engage children in math and science and teach them and encourage them to learn. And it uses technology so that teachers, it trains teachers, so that teachers can focus on children that are falling behind as opposed to constantly working from the middle and leaving children behind. This is an enormous opportunity as we look in the future. So what do we need to do? Well, hopefully we're going to discuss a lot of that and this morning and create an environment on how to create an environment that creates lifelong learning and employability and promotes science and technology. So with that, I'd like to go right um, to our questions. And I'd like to start with Bruno. Um, could you talk a little bit about what we can do to improve science training in secondary education and how the region can foster the next generation. How, how can we make scientists um, and innovators out of this generation? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I think to answer those, uh, that question, I would like to highlight three points. One is that what is the value of science? What is the value of technology? I think it's very important to understand that um, science and technology underpins the innovation, medium and long term. Yesterday we had a session about driving innovation, and education one was really one of the outcomes um, of the working groups all over again, in all um, tables we were working on. The value of science, um, I'm, and I'm talking about basic science, like um, physics, um, and research in, in, in this, this kind of field. For example, in my case, I, sp I spent like six years doing astrophysics, doing basic research, and I understand the value of that. But also applied science, and how you bridge that basic research to applied science, which is what I'm doing now at Mapbox. So it is very important to understand the value of science for society long term. And that brings me to the second point, which is the importance of role models, the importance of having people that uh, kids, the students can look upon and say, I could do that. I had the pleasure to talk in, here in Latin America in a, in a few countries, and it's very welcoming to see how engaged the students are when they see someone who has chosen the path of science because they are motivated to do that, and they see that it is possible to thrive. Now, how you do that? There are a few things we need to, we need to work on. And if you look at, um, at the latest statistics that the OCDE about um, Latin America, there are eight countries. None of the countries surpass half the students in mathematical skills, minimum mathematical skills. We have, there is a lot, um, a lot to improve on. And, but it's important to have these role models and to understand the value of, of science and technology in, in general. And then the last point I wanted to, to highlight before we can start with the rounds of questions afterwards is how you do that. I think one of the key points to do that, and you highlighted that before, is to shift from a memory-based education system where we train students to repeat what they are being taught into a process-based education, where critical thinking is important, where being able to, to describe, to understand, to understand the problems and the challenges they are faced instead of just repeating what they've, they've heard two weeks before. So going to a process-based education is going to be key, especially in technology, because we are educating always for the future. And what kids are, are, are learning now is, gonna, is not going to be the technology they're going to be using where they are um, in the workforce on their adults. So these three things, what is the value of science in society in general, the importance of role models, and to see if to a process-based um, education system. I'm going to ask, we'll come back to the three really important things. But before I leave you, I just want to ask you one more question. Who was your role model? <laughs> um, I have a few. Feynman is really one of them, because he worked in so many things, and he was able to work really in the high level. Richard Feynman is a very famous physicist. But at the same time, he was able to understand the value um, of love, life, and the connection with other fellow humans. So he is one of my role models. There are many others, but um, it is, he is one of them. And when, 
When you're a role model, which I'm in a position sometimes to be when I speak, one of the best feedback I can get from students is what I got a few times in my hometown and other places, which is, it's amazing that if you are there, it means I can be there too. That's, this is very important. That's great. Thank you very much. Acercio. Tell me, do you think that technology can be a catalyst to boost education in Latin America? Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, before I ask this question, I think uh, it's important to position the moment that, that we live today. So it's certainly uh, what we call the, the, what we are living, the digital economy. So the technology today is, is not helping the society or helping the citizens. The technology is basically, and is for sure, driving the new behavior of the human being. It's not, you're not changing our behavior because of the technology, but technology is really driving it. So all of us here, of course, have one, two, three, in the average three, but certainly some of you have much more than, than, than three smartphones or any kind of technology in your hands, for sure. And then also in the average, each one of you have about 40 applications that you are helping to, to use in your life, independent on business, just for your life. So it's driving the way we read, we watch, we eat, we communicate to people, is driving everything, an application is everything, and is driving the, I would say, the future that is right now, actually. Uh, and in the same time, and as representing uh, being the technology industry here, uh, the companies are growing a lot, and the, the, like I said, the, the, the growth rate of this digital economy is incredible. In the same time, the growth rate in the, for in the education for people who's been prepared for this digital economy is not growing at the same rate. So, of course, that we have um, millions of people that are having access to study, or they are growing, they are brilliant people to grow with new startup companies or to, with great ideas, but the industry, the technology industry needs today, and we don't have it, the millions of programmers architects or people to work in this digital economy to provide even better applications to everyone. And so, what to position that? So we have here too many things being provided and we would need too many, much more people to come to work in this digital economy if they were ready to work. Why do I say that? Because this is for me two lines of thought that actually is a, it's a paradox because to provide these millions of people to work in this digital economy, the technology should be also be provided to all of them. So the technology should be also be in the hands of everyone, everywhere. So, and this is actually not happening today, and how this technology could help and be actually the catalyst of, uh, of this growth today. So, uh, if, I, if we have the, the private, uh, private companies like big banks, they are doing what we call the, uh, I don't know if translated from Portuguese to, to English, but uh, bankarization. So try to provide the bank services to everyone and great ideas like boats going to places that they do not have technology just to have access mm -hmm. to the technology there. What would happen to the world if you could create the Edu 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 educationalization, I don't know, if we to, to provide technology for everyone. Right. So this would be awesome. So I, I, I was born in Brazil, in a small city, 10,000 inhabitants, in the middle of nowhere. My dad has never studied before, but he moved to Sao Paulo to provide his children to study. Today I'm here as the president of American company in Latin America, but every time that I go there and I visit my f family that I have there and I see some of them still walking hours to go to school for three hours class, what would happen 
to these people, could happen to these people if they have access to technology. Provide access to technology would make a huge, how many brilliant people do we have there, everywhere, so CA, Technology, for example, uh, last year we invested 50% of our social budget for projects in Chile, in Argentina, in Peru, or even in Colombia. And the basic of our projects was let's help institutions to provide access to technology to people. So, of course, there is nothing based on what the government and private companies could do to provide this to these to these people. So, and for sure, if 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 people, everyone, everywhere could have access to technology, this would make a huge difference and technology for sure in this case would be the catalyst of education. No doubt at all about that. So if you were just adding a question to your question, if you were making government policy, do you think it would be a good investment to give every child in high school a tablet? As this is, this is this is personal, because I'm a person who was born in a place that mm -hmm. there's absolutely not even education, basic education, or even technology. I had no doubt about that. And actually, uh, if we are, when you give, when you provide technology to everyone, you are not giving these people, uh, depending on the model, three hours of education per day. You are providing them 24 hours of education per day. So these people at, with six, seven years old, they would be awesome. They were not starting going to school at six or seven years old. They would start at much earlier, and they, they could be like genius, brilliant people coming from everywhere, in, not even in Brazil. Latin, so Latin America, this could be a huge difference for the region. And uh, thank you, I, I agree with that because you know we're we're increasing the gap between the rich and the poor because wealthy people can afford to give their three-year-olds an iPhone and people that don't have access to that mm -hmm. can. And so it used to be when you read at six, you began to increase the gap. And now it's much, much earlier. And I totally agree with you. Thank okay. um, you. How could Latin American universities um, partner with um, U.S. universities or global universities um, to bring students, let's say, to Rensselaer. But more importantly, it's one thing to make a partnership. It's another thing for the young people to have the skills mm -hmm. to be able to succeed um, at a place like your university. Sure. What kind of skills and, and what kind of partnerships can really be developed? Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to respond to your question, Susan. I think uh, it's not just a question of partnership between Latin American universities and U.S. universities, but really it's a three-way partnership that you have to develop between universities and industry. Because I believe it's the industry that has a vested interest in really reducing the skills gap that we have talked about so far. All right, so um, in a science and technology innovation-based society where innovations are really the driving engines for economic growth, um, companies are looking for trained talent. They're looking for talent with basic competence as well as with advanced skills, right? Basic competence that is translates into a high school education where students have seen science and mathematics, and then again, as the companies innovate, they are looking for talent at the mm -hmm. higher level, people with uh, tertiary degrees and diplomas in science and technology. Now, this is a challenge in this region where the number of uh, high school educated individuals has lagged behind what has happened in other parts of the world. So you have, uh, uh, whereas the number in the United States is 89%, in Chile, Brazil, and Mexico, that number is roughly 69%. 41% and 33%, I believe. So um, th this problem is even more dramatic or more dire when you start to think about STEM-based education, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, those fields, uh, even though there are large enrollments of students in those fields, Latin American students have uh, not performed at par with their peers internationally. 
well less than 1% of Latin American students score in the highest levels in international science and mathematics proficiency tests. So this is a real serious problem for us. And where does it all begin? I think it begins with poor teaching. Right. So that's something that we have to address as part of our partnerships. Um, in South Korea, 5%, the top 5% of graduates go into teaching. That number is 10% in Finland and the top 30% in Singapore. Uh, if you look at Latin America, 33% of high school teachers in Brazil barely pass their high school certificate exams. In Mexico, 70% of teachers had difficulty with the national teacher's examination. So this is an endemic problem that we have to address. And I believe universities and industry can come together very effectively to overcome this. Uh, industries can certainly partner with uh, universities to set up teacher training programs. And by that, I don't mean simply uh, basic skills being given to teachers. What I'm talking about are more sophisticated programs of the type where teachers go through academic training at universities, advanced training, and then they have internship opportunities with industry that really motivates them, excites them, makes them a better teacher. They're able to communicate with their students more effectively because that is what you're really looking for, is a teacher in the classroom who can motivate their student. So um, there are other ways in which this can be done as well, of course, that uh, you can create um, uh, advanced programs for teachers uh, at the universities where uh, just-in-time knowledge can be imparted to them, and this can be done on a continuing basis. And your thoughts about technology make an important uh, contribution in this arena as well, because they don't really have to come to you necessarily for the education, but could do this uh, from where they're located themselves. Um, I think the bridging the skills gap at the higher level where industry is looking for trained personnel to innovate in their companies, I think that's a relatively easier problem to address. Uh, it's easier because uh, as new material develops, uh, universities typically move quickly to translate that into course content. Uh, they come up with new diplomas and degrees, but I think packages of that could actually be used uh, to bring up to speed the talent of the existing workforce within the organization. And I think in this uh, context, uh, things like blended learning, uh, online learning, it has a very important role to play. Uh, I think I'll just close my comments by saying that uh, the, uh, we, we cannot afford to neglect this. This is not an issue that we can neglect. Uh, failure to bridge the skills gap uh, can be very expensive for the corporate center, uh, sector. There's a loss in morale of the existing workforce because people are overworked. Uh, only the few individuals with the knowledge and they're required to deliver all the time. Uh, there's a decline in the quality of the products. And uh, keeping up with uh, innovative advances, if you don't keep up with innovative advances that your competitor is bringing to the field, then this can be devastating to your business as well. Thank you very much for your comments, which really leads in, uh, Blas, to, to you. There is a skills gap mm -hmm. um, that exists today. How significant is it? And, and how, when do we start training people to fill that future skills gap? Could you talk a little bit about that? Gracias. Bueno, yo como soy mi lengua materna es el español y además. Since my mother language is Spanish, and I believe that most of the present today are, Sp are Spanish speakers, I will stay in Spanish to answer the questions. It's regarding the skills and the gaps we found, and demand gaps generated in human capital. I believe that this is a reality in all countries. This is not necessarily an alarming topic to us. It's an existing situation. In Latin America, we do believe the gaps are large. There are some recent studies have carried out and reviewed it has, that have to do with human capital related to technologies and it basically stated that practically in all Latin American countries we're confronting a critical situation and specifically for Argentina which is a country that has invested greatly in economy but at the same time there's a gap of about 31 percent in which we had countries such as Costa Rica that the gap was so we're close to 50 percent so definitely these are real problems and when we think about a different sector there's another sector affecting several Latin American countries' economy? Well, we 
already know there is a real problem related to the zone, but surely this will become a severe problem for the upcoming four or five years because of the recent events that have taken place. For example, the hydrocarbons market in Mexico during the last year, at the same time the exploitation of new wells in Brazil, and also the adjudication of from the government to different areas to be explored. And as a matter of fact, there's another significant action, the vaca muerta or dead cow effect in Argentina, which is to be exploited in the upcoming three or four years. And apparently, we're talking about a reserve volume, which is actually very significant that we can actually address this in the country as one of the grandest reservoirs for Venezuela. I am not necessarily an expert, but I, this is information of research. So this demand and capital, human capital gap exists in our country, and this is a reality for ADECO as, long, as well as with the University USEA in France. We have created an index, which is an index that measures talent, global talent, and it basically measures the capacity countries have in order for them to attract and retain human capital in these countries. This is actually a ranking in which we studied 103 countries, which correspond to 87% of the world population and somewhere around 95% of our GDP worldwide. So in other, word, in other words, this is actually a very significant sum. And within this index, this talent index, we can say that, well, not necessarily the countries in the zone are looking very good. We're also talking about very significant changes. The country that comes out the best in the ranking is Chile. If it's 31, for example, Costa Rica, they can change it. This is the Ministry of Panama, so we can go ahead and provide the adequate action. To, from the medium halfway, but we're talking about the rest of the countries that are midway down. So we're actually talking about very dramatic data, such as Bolivia, Venezuela, and actually we were taking about the last advantages of our ranking testing with 103 countries, and with other alarming actions, such as in Bolivia, we have more than 80-something percent. I think it's about 87 students per professor, actually. I don't know if this is for high school or at least in the case of Venezuela, they don't even provide the information to UNESCO. I mean, you can even imagine that these figures are actually very, we can imagine what figures are they referring. So this actually highlights a very important difference in the zone amongst the different countries, especially for those on the Pacific area, which have addressed themselves to different free trade agreements with the European Union, with the United States, with China. They continue growing and developing at a rhythm that other countries have actually bet on their development and it's about assisting one and the other, but I still don't believe they have models that are a little bit more popular. They still don't get to obtain progress, and they still don't obtain progress in education in a similar rhythm. Any case, in any case, I do believe it's important for us to measure and understand which are these current gaps, but at the same time, it's also important for us to understand where are these gaps heading to. In, I think it was in 2010, the secretary, uh, the um, American U the American Secretary of Education stated, and I believe it's very important for us to highlight this, the fact that in 2010, out of 10 professions amongst the most requested professions or the, the professions with grandest demand in the United States back in 2010, these are professions that did not exist back in 2004. So they're saying that the positions or professions mostly requested for in the United States did not exist 10 years before. So if we're talking about colleagues and if we think about the data that I am not necessarily familiarized with, but for example, for the development of a video game, you need about 200 technical profiles that before I can say that they definitely did not exist. But if we go ahead and speak about uh, not just a video game, for probably a movie, a film, then we're talking about 400 technical profiles in order for them to develop these type of products, which are of a very high demand. And as a matter of fact, about 10 or 15 years ago, these professions didn't even exist. So it is very important for us to work on these gaps. It's very important for us to work on this demand skills, but not just the current ones, because we know that the current ones are not necessarily the ones that will exist for the future. And just to 
conclude, if there is any way in which we can intervene in what has to be done by governments and by different models, well, evidently I believe that the recipe is not an easy recipe. But on the other hand, evidently we, the recipe is not an easy one. Elsewise, we wouldn't find the situation. But we've already spoken about some possible solutions, some pro possible e-learning models and technology models in schools. As a matter of fact, I don't necessarily think this has to be at a high school level. This has to be before. It's something basic and it's something very complex in the zone. It's not very easy for you to provide all of these tools in all countries, especially the countries with larger populations. But let me wrap up here. Let me finish soon. Uh, we need to focus on models. We need to focus on high school education. There are some countries that follow this model. For example, Brazil, they have models to, for the promotion of school assistance, but if they still, they still remain in the basic model without escalating high school education. Thank you very much. That, that we've talked about a lot of different things, but one of the things that you said very early on, and, and it touches on, I think, um, what many of you said, was that we're going from a memory-based kind of teaching um, to a process-based and to critical thinking. And that touches, it's what you said, it touches on your whole view on giving young people access to technology. It goes to math and science. It goes to um, secondary education and filling the skills gap. Could someone comment? Would anybody like to make a comment on this and give us your views as to how you get there um, in Latin America? Uh, how, how, do we, how do we do this in tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we need to do it today, not <laughs> tomorrow. So um, I can only comment that the, um, the barrier to access knowledge is getting low and low, through technology mostly. So even though it is true, we, we should also address the divide in urban-rural, which is a huge challenge to give access to technology in the rural areas. When you have access to technology, having access to the knowledge is easy. And in many cases, like Coursera, Khan Academy, or even Wikipedia, um, gives you access to start making this thought process of, of uh, critical thinking. And to the point that Blas was saying before, none of the tools I use today in my work, I study them in my education. <laughs> it's only because I learn how to think, how to process, how to learn is what I'm able to, to shift to that. So when we are educating for a future where the top 10 jobs and do not exist today, this is why we need to focus on them, on, on critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Also because critical thinking is gonna allow us to maximize the, um, what some people call the social elevator, where people with less access to wealth can um, change in and have a better outcome, even though they didn't have the opportunities that other, other students with more um, income could have accessed. Why? Because this, this critical thinking is inherent to you, not to the knowledge that you are given. When you learn to learn, you don't have basically limits of what you could learn. Thank you. May I just add to that that I think that uh, critical thinking today is even more important than it was a few years back. I mean, the internet is the new library. But you know, before a book or a journal got into the library, it went through a peer review process. What was in those books or journals was validated by somebody. So you could take that to the bank, that information you could take to the bank and say that this is verifiable information. When you have access to the web like you do today, as we have spoken about, where you start learning at age one or two, uh, you're bringing up information on the web, you're picking up that. There, is, there has to be a way where you are taught to think critically as to whether that information that you're receiving, does that make sense? The validity of information is that much more important today. So, cr critical thinking is, uh, I, I had an early access technology. So I, I had my honeymoon, for example, this person in Mauritius Island. And I went there, I never heard about it before, but it was a suggestion of the travel agency, I went there, I discovered there that there was a, a duck, a little duck that was, has been extinguished years ago called Dudu. 
and I bought one little gift, and I brought and give it to my to my nephew, my nephew that I I love him, six years old. I said, hey, this is for you. I thought that he was, oh, little ducky, this is beautiful. He said, oh, th isn't this doo doo, mm -hmm. uncle? How do you know that? I thought that it has been extinguished, like in the <laughs> 12 years, 200 years ago. How do you know that? So he knew that I was going to Mauritius Island. He probably had access, Google it, learn everything. This is unbelievable. This is unbelievable what happens to people when they have access to information and they learn. Oh, today I see my two years old daughter trying to, when she sees some advertising and things like that, and she tries to, oh, let me move here. So this is <laughs> what will, it scares me what will happen to her when she's six or seven. So, so again, so what do we need to do today? It's, it's, it's tough. Uh, the iPad is, is the appliance. What is inside of it is the application, what, what we call software. And software is uh, rewriting human behavior. Software is rewriting the way of thinking. Software is rewriting the way we communicate, the way we buy, the way we do everything. And, and, that's, and software can rewrite the educational system. So I think this is the main thought that I have in my mind. Well, a little bit along the lines, evidently one of the ways in order for us to obtain progress, I mean, traditionally speaking, especially in our times, we worked in cognitive schemes. I believe that cognitive schemes I mean, it's not necessary for us to continue working on them. As we've stated before, the information is available on the internet. So for this reason, we need to go ahead and teach youth groups that they need to no longer memorize. They need to provide this information. They need to learn how to search for this information out on the internet. And we need to focus greatly on profiles, social, emotional, and cultural profiles in a greatly manner in comparison to these cognitive skills that we usually start working with. Thank you very much. So before we start taking questions to the audience, we have one question from Carolina Faro. Um, from Facebook, and I'm going to read it in, in Spanish. In Peru, professors for public education are demanded to have master's degrees. They also have annual testings or examinations. Because it goes to the skill gap, and I was wondering what you think about training teachers on an annual basis and forcing them to take exams to make sure that their skills um, are where they need to be. I think you touched a little bit on that uh, in your remarks, but who would like to take this question? Well, I can, uh, I, I can certainly offer this, that um, exams are just one mechanism for determining the quality of, of teaching. Uh, certainly you want to make sure that a teacher who's in front of uh, your student, your child, is appropriately qualified. You don't want uh, somebody who's never had mathematics in, in their own college education up in, in front of a class trying to teach high school students mathematics. Uh, that certainly is a, is a requirement, but how frequently you do it, whether you have to do it once a year, uh, we have experience with attorneys and with uh, medical doctors, uh, certification, to having to take your qualifying exams, your license exams all over again. Maybe it's a good idea just to see whether you've kept up with the skills. Anybody even? Yes. Perhaps it's also a good idea to help them. It's very important, and we raised the point of, of the need to be, make sure that those who educate not have the skills to do that and Absolutely. the material. So to that point, helping making these materials more available and, and focusing on those who have the most problems to, to provide them with the tools they, they need. So not only for the students, technology for the students, but also for the educators, which are the enablers for the more wider audience. And helping teachers learn what I think we've all learned at home, that they can learn from their students how to use technology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe. We all learn from our young children. Um, let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, there are microphones. If someone has a question, back here. 
And Esteban, Esteban, I know who you are, but if you could identify yourself, that would be great. So let's start with Esteban over here. Good morning to everyone. I'm Esteban Bullrich. I'm the Minister of Education of the City of Buenos Aires. I'm also a YGL like Bruno. Um, I had a comment and, and a question. The comment is, we haven't mentioned values. And I think a big part of education today should be trying to make better human beings. Because uh, we have a lot of engineers that have gone to the dark side <laughs> and have made the world a, a worse place to live. And, and I'm not going to go into names. But um, so I think, uh, and my question would be, what place do each one of you give to a more uh, holistic education, including the spirit of the, of, of the kids, um, making them more resilient? And to do that, you have to go for the mind, you have to go to the body, but also for the spirit and the values of those kids. So I wanted to hear from each one of you what place do you give to that? Could you start with that? Yes, hey, well, this is uh, especially me that I'm not from an uh, educational area and technology industry. But uh, at ACO, you have a great heart. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do. So that, that's why when you start speaking, one, one, I, I start thinking about something. And so, in, in, in my, the experience that I just shared with you, so my my parents, they, have ne they never had access to any kind of study. So they just learned how to read and write. And if I, but I am so proud of them. I am so proud of them. Because they never had education, but they had the wisdom to coach and to give the right instructions and education inside, in, at home to his children. So. If I am someone today, it's not exactly because I had access to technology or I had access to education, but I had something much more special, which was someone teach me, teaching me how to be a great human being. If without that, technology is dead. I, I agree with you. So it's certainly a terrific point that you mentioned. And we, we, we cannot lose that. It's not the way to transform the technology. Just give an iPad to someone and forget about school. You can never do that to anyone. So provide access to technology to help them to be someone better and faster and, and to discover the brilliant people that we have around Latin America, every country, everywhere, every city. But we can never forget on how to teach these people to be a great human being. So it's an excellent point, just a thought that came into my mind as a personal experience. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, I think this is a, a very interesting question because uh, clearly uh, one of the things I've noted in my own career, it's a 24-year career at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, that the student that we are receiving at the front end is also changing. Uh, we are predominantly an engineering institution, almost 58% of our students are engineers. But uh, at the same time, the student that is coming in today is different. They have a social conscience, they want to do certain things with their lives that I think a few years ago was not the case. So as an institution, you have to adjust. And our motto, our motto going forward is that we want to put in our students an intellectual agility, a multicultural sophistication, and a global view. This is what we work with. All of our programs are designed with this in mind. And um, it, it's no longer just about teaching in the classroom. It is a continuum of education that you practice that goes from the classroom into the residence halls where support exists both from the professors as well as residence life professionals. They uh, tag and team with uh, individuals in their own class, they form clubs, they pursue activities precisely of the type that you speak about. Spot on. Um, yes, totally. <laughs> Education is about values and it's about tools. And um, values is, gon is what is going to give you the, um, the capacity to decide what, how to use those tools. And I think that in science and technology, 
it's easier to bring those values in part because science is universal. So the values of we are here together in a common environment, for example, it's, it's broad when you start studying biology or nature or physics. But values is also important at a very small level to care about your community, how you can help in that, Take, to care about your country, to, to help it, because it's the one who is investing in you, is, is helping you to be educated. So um, I agree with you that values is, is a very important part of education. Nothing else to add. It's, to add. it's truly the same. Uh, my name is Andrew Wilson from Santo Domingo. This is directed to Bruno. Uh, what about your education allowed you to go from hard science to entrepreneurism? Uh, and is there any insight about uh, your education, educational experience, uh, to make that, that path possible? Thank you. Um, it is difficult. It is very difficult because we tend to frame, we tend to frame education, and those who chose the path of basic education are framed as that. Those who choose, for example, in my case, to do rocket science, they are rocket scientists, and when they try to look for a job, it's like we don't need a rocket scientist. It happened to me. I could not change from my old work to my new work, and I, I thought I had value to do that. My skills were useful, but it's very difficult. The answer is that it's very difficult, but it is possible. And those who are making that path is, again, going back to the role models, that you can do that. You can use your skills. Probably I'm not using my knowledge of plasma physics, but I'm using my skills to, to tackle on new problems on, on Mapbox. So yeah, the answer is that it's, it is difficult. It's something we should work on to, uh, for the public in general to, to see the value of, of science um, and technology, which is what, how I started them, my, my remarks today. Back here. Hello. 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 I'm Leandro Pizarroni. I'm a global shaper from the Cordoba Hub in Argentina. Uh, I have, in the last couple of years, I had the opportunity to, to talk in front of high school teachers and tell things about native digitals and millennials and how the job market is changing and this new way of learning, online learning, etc. And they they told me. Uh, Yes, we know, we agree with you, we see this, these problems, uh, but we have to, uh, we have curricula to follow, uh, we have to do these things that are prepared in the program, and we have this task uh, to achieve. On the other hand, I have participated in the IT sectorial table uh, with the Minister of Education in Cordoba, and he was saying, yeah, we are doing this prototype, this pilot project in one school, in two school about software, teaching, and that, that kind of stuff. My question is, how can we build a scalable uh, model for education that we can uh, up, uh, uh, apply these uh, practices and, um, I mean, scalable that can reach a lot of uh, schools? Thanks. Who would like to take this question, this easy question? <laughs> Maybe I'll take a, a shot at it. Okay. All right. So I, I think education, uh, you, you really have to let the people who are teaching feel as if they are making a difference. So you cannot go in with a proposed model of your own and tell them that this is what works. I think what they have to do is to embrace it on their own. They have to see the value in doing what you're proposing that they do. Um, there is as much of a socialization content in education as there is delivery of material, just raw material. So really education is a coupling of the two. It is the social aspect and it is the knowledge content part. Um, if you can put the tools in a format that actually makes the best use of technology, and the flipped classroom is a terrific example <coughs> of this, that uh, students actually do a little bit of their own uh, before they come to classroom and rather than sitting in front of a teacher who will then give them a boring lecture, they actually uh, work on problems that actually help promote their critical learning, critical thinking skills. If the teacher sees an advantage in doing this, then you have a win-win situation. And I think this is really how it has to be cast. 
Scalability is an issue that has been tossed around a lot in recent times, I think. With the advent of MOOCs, people have said that all problems will be addressed with MOOCs. Uh, I'm a skeptic, I'll, I'll admit it. Uh, MOOCs have a place, but I think they have an even bigger role to play as specially packaged online courses right on your residential campuses. Yes, they get access to education in remote parts of the world, but they are not necessarily the best way for a student to learn and develop. Um, let's take a question over here. Good morning. My name is Juliana Ramon. I'm a global shaper from the Santo Domingo Hub, Dominican Republic. Professor Hagela briefly commented on the cause-effect relationship between the teachers and the quality of of education in Latin America. In some of our countries, particularly the case of the Dominican Republic, teaching is no longer an aspiration. It's, it's no longer an aspirational profession from many reasons widening from salaries to the social consideration of profession. Would you think that the root of the problem might also be considered the lack of dignification of the profession in our countries? No question. No question about that. I think uh, you asked uh, Bruno, the question as to who their role model was, and if you had asked me that question, I would have said my parents. Both of them are teachers, and uh, they are the inspirational force that has brought me into this profession. Clearly, I mean, if you look at places like Finland or uh, even South Korea, the academic profession is richly rewarded, mm -hmm. and that really does help in bringing the best talent to the classroom. You live in Brazil. Do you think that's the case in Brazil as well? Of course it is. So of course it is, and I think it need to take, uh, I don't know, years ahead to try to change this. So the importance of, for me, the importance of the teacher will be always high and high. It's just everyone is adjusting to the new board as well as the teachers will be. So if we don't have the real values coming from them at home, and even the teachers must be there to give the real values and the good use of that. If you just give the technology, you will create very smart and intelligent monsters. Mm -hmm. So you need to have the, the power and, and the importance of the teacher there. And they need to be motivated to do that as well. So she's right. So we have time for a few more questions. Um, let's take one back there, and then we'll take one over here. Good morning. Hi, my name is Alexander Bro from Sengage Learning. Um, I think we have heard a lot about tools and access and even value as it comes to education, and I couldn't agree more to you know what has been said. But uh, don't we kind of underestimate or kind of forget a little bit a third element, which is the actual content of learning? I think uh, we have looked into numerous projects of sponsored by governments, NGOs, and others to put iPads in the hand of kids, and this is great. They learn a lot. They learn how to deal with an iPad, they get digitally savvy and all of that, but what do they learn actually beyond that when they play with an iPad? And we found that there is a dramatic lack of suitable content when you put these devices in the hands of children, more of children than for grown-ups, because grown-ups tend to know at some point their way around to find free content somewhere. Um, so my question is, A, whether you agree to that, and, but this, more the question is, do you see any specific trends in terms of demands of what type of content has to be provided, uh, specifically in the K-12 area and beyond that as well? And if you have come across any interesting models of partnerships who produce these type of applications and contents uh, which are run on these devices then? Um, what I want to do, because we have eight minutes left, is take two questions at the same time. So could we take the one back here, and maybe one more there, and we'll answer all three questions at the same time. Hi, my name is Martin Aspillaga. My company is in technical education and K-12. Uh, I'm from Peru, and I'm also a, a young global leader, as, as Esteban and, and Bruno. My question, just to be brief, is uh, there's, there's been a, Latin America is one of the regions where the uh, private sector has had uh, a very big role compared to other regions. But today there's a, there's a whole discussion, particularly in certain countries like Chile, but also in Peru and, and other countries, about the role of the private sector, particularly the for-profit private sector, and the government and the state. And my question is if, if you see this as an opportunity to strike a new balance you know, across the board between the public role and the private role, or, or it is a, a menace, a threat to the development of education. 
Thank you. And we'll take one more question. This person's been having his hand up since the beginning. Yes, my name is Uclive Rojas. Yes, my name is Uclive Rojas. I am a program shaper for Jose Jose Costa Rica. I would like for you to get into greater details related to gender disparity for technology and education. Costa Rica, for example, between 350,000 to individuals are many, meaning that they do not work nor do they stud study. About 81% of them are women. In other words, education is not getting in the same way to women or men, and not even salaries are. So gender inequity. And finally, how come of all speakers there's not one that is a woman? I think Lucy was going to be, but she doesn't have a voice. So that's why there's only men here. And the moderator is a woman. Room and if you you don't have to comment on all three, but we have like five more minutes, so each of you get like a minute to comment on the questions. Sobre la primera cuestión en relación a los contenidos, bueno. Well, the first item related to content, I believe that evidently, yes, it is true. Like always in several initiatives, we initiatives usually move forth faster. But since I know that at least the main editorials in Latin America, which are usually global editorials, they're already working on this. As a matter of fact, I have some data from Brazil, from the main editorials from textbooks. They have more than 30% of their sales related to digital programs, with which effectively, yes, there is a lack of content that we are currently working on. And regarding Martin's question, I believe if it doesn't, I think it has to do with the public sector. I believe that recently with the last presidential elections that took place last year in Chile, well, I think we haven't done much, but at least with the selections flag, or at least the critical item in which we had the best or the most reform has to do with the educational system. The current Bachelet president, President Bachelet, based her current campaign on the educational model and public education for Latin America and all other countries. Obviously, this is crucial and important to education. And there's nothing to be done if we don't work with the public sector and if we don't work with high school education. So about content, um, my experience is that um, Helping in content happens through outreach in many cases, for example in astronomy, where astronomers create products to help um, educators bring that knowledge. This is not a solution. This is something who, that needs to be institutionalized. And actually in many countries what happens about content is that it's being driven by committees or even by regions that set those, those content. So yes, I agree that we should focus also on the content on the content about, um, that we educate on. About the role of uh, Martin's question about the private sector, there is a huge role. I think, I believe there is a huge role and in many ways. One way would be to help access to technology, to promote access and use of technology. Um, there are cases like, for example, one laptop per child that um, happen. Then the question is, what is the impact of that? So everyone has a laptop. What, what happens? Can we monitor if there is an improvement on education at least? Also, um, there are new models for uh, for-profit companies that can help education. This is also the case of my company, Mapbox. We, we base our product in open source, open data. And we actually are very active into helping the community and helping educate. We give workshops. For example, when I came to Panama, I gave one, gave one to, to NGOs. And there is really a, a role in these new models of for-profit businesses. OK, and just to, to finish about gender, yes, absolutely agree with, uh, with your question. And actually, um, it is not only education. If you took a look at the statistics, it changes also the statistics for math. Women tend to perform worse. And when you look at the statistics of um, capacity to, to read and to understand text, women perform better. So it's not a systemic problem of education per se. It's also culturally what we um, um, incentivize women to do that. I'm sorry that I'm rushing people, but I have someone <laughs> telling me we have two minutes. So there's you. Well, so quick comments only. So content is extremely important. So you give access, they have access to the good things, they, they have access to the bad things as well. So if they don't have the values and the right things being teached, they, have, they will become monsters with good and bad. 
uh, the role of the private sector. So even in Peru, for example, we have invested a little in some institutions as a private company. But for sure, let's not be, it's because we have some kind of advantage to do that. So it's a kind of, a kind of win-win. Of course, that if you have some agreement between government and private sector to make that a, a kind of obligation instead of just you have some benefits if you do it, it would be much better. And I, I run Latin America in CA Technologies. I have three senior leaders reporting to me. One for Mexico, it's one man. One for Brazil, it's another man. One country to each one of them. The other 30 countries is a woman, a Colombian woman, because only a woman to have ability to handle all of that with, with yes. greatly. So <laughs> that's my comment. Outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> so quickly, I think uh, the content market is a big one and uh, there are a number of uh, educational companies that have actually undertaken developing content for iPads and laptops and so on and so forth, uh, both for secondary education as well as the market is moving into the tertiary education field. As far as women is, uh, is concerned, I think uh, we cannot afford to leave 50% of the population behind if we are to make progress as a... Uh, the um, women, I mean, I'll, this is contrary to your point, women in science and engineering at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute do better than men by a full 10 percentage points. So if we can get women to come into science and technology, they will outpace men. That's a great way to end this panel. I want to thank the panelists and I just want to conclude by saying I think we talked about some amazing concepts, the value of education and science, the importance of role models, the idea of process-based uh, learning and critical thinking, technology, how we can change the world by bringing technology at a very early age to all people. Uh, we change the young people and their parents and their households as well. Um, the importance of values and how you need to learn them in school and at home and it's an important part of education, STEM, um, and how important it is to prepare young people to really study STEM um, and the skills gap and how I think we need to start to think about and fill it at a very, very early age. Obviously, we talked about teacher training and also making sure that they are appreciated by society. So with that, I'd like to give a very round, loud round of applause to our panelists. Thank you so much.